listen, let's all make this declaration. Just say this. Say, I'm about to receive the Word of God. I boldly confess. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. And I'll never be the same. Never, never, never. In Jesus' name. Now give God a big hand of praise like we believe it. Give two people a high five. Tell them they look good in church and you can be seated. If you're watching online, I just want to tell you, thank you for watching online. Many people watch live and then throughout the week, our replay. It means the world to us that you would do that. I'd also say this, if you're ever in Texas in the Bryan College Station area, come out to a New Heights Church service live. I promise you, we'll make you feel right at home in Jesus' name. Listen, I want to talk this morning about a topic that you could go to church the rest of your life and never hear about. You could go to church the rest of your life and you'd never hear about it. The reason is, is because a lot of people don't understand it. So what we do is we, we, we teach and we talk about what we understand or what we have experienced. And sometimes that can be positive. Sometimes that can be a limiting agent. So for us, we want to go to the depths of God. We want to dive in as, as far as we can go in God. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. We want to see the hand of God move in our life. We want to see the word of God perform in our life. We want to see God do what he said he would do in our life. That's my testimony. Is that what you'd like to? I'd like to see God do something in my life before I go to heaven. So here's what happens. A lot of times people, they, they, they spend their, their whole life building up to a place where they get saved. And I'm, th th today's message is going to assume that you're born again, okay? If you're not, we'll talk about that at the end of the message. But praise the Lord, I'm going to assume you love God because you're in church on a Sunday morning. But a lot of people, they get saved, and then they never go anywhere past that. I was talking to a friend of mine this week, and it really lined up well with my studies this week, because he was talking to me about what New Heights Church has meant to him over the past six years. He's been here almost six years. He said, it's meant so much to me. He said, it's like I knew I was saved, but I didn't know why. He said, a New Heights Church has taught me why I'm saved and what I should do. I grew up. In a Christian household, if you didn't grow up in a Christian household, that doesn't make you less than. I'm just going to tell my story because I know it better than I know your story. You know what I'm saying? But I grew up in a Christian household. I grew up uh, being, being drugged to church. Matter of fact, that's the only drug problem I've ever had was being drugged to church. <laughs> I grew up in a church where uh, you were going to be quiet in church, but whether or not you were conscious in church, that was up to you. Because your parents would tell you, does anybody have any parents that would ask you, do you want to go to the restroom? But they didn't mean like to go to the restroom. You're like, no, I don't want to go to the restroom. You ask my kids that want to go to the restroom, they're like, no, I don't really need to go. They don't they have no idea what that means. My, I, I might be the last generation that knows what that means. Do you need to go to the bathroom? I will hold it. Praise the Lord. I am actually fine. I grew up drawing on bulletins and, and playing tic-tac-toe uh, on the bulletins of, of, the, of the church, but somehow or another, faith still got on the inside of me because faith comes by hearing. hearing, that's right. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So my life, you know, I grew up loving and knowing Jesus. So I would hear these guys give these testimonies, and it would be like, you know, I used to you know, do drugs or sell drugs or, you know, whatever, all the different things. And, and if that's your testimony, I salute you, but that's never been my testimony. So I was always kind of torn. I was like, man, it's like, I don't have one. I know I, I love God because my parents taught me to love God. I love God because I watched them love God in front of me. And, and so for me, it was a little bit of a challenge. I always kind of felt like I kind of had a less than testimony, you know, which is not true, but that's how it felt to me. And I remember I went to camp one time and there was an 18-year-old counselor. I was about 12 years old. There was an 18-year-old counselor that was there. And one night, you know, it was the big push to get everybody saved. And, and this guy says to the group of, you know, half a dozen or a dozen boys that are there. He says, if you don't remember the moment you're saved, you're not saved. Well, here I am, 12 years old. I've asked Jesus into my heart at least a thousand times. I've answered every altar call the preacher ever gave, praise the Lord. My parents taught me to love and serve Jesus. He has spoken to me. He had touched me at this point in my life. I knew Jesus. 
But this guy's telling me, I said, well, I don't remember the first time that I asked Jesus into my life. And this guy said to me, he said, well, you're going to go to hell. I thought, I'm going to need to call somebody real quick. He said, no, you can't call anybody. I said, bro, you just told me I'm going to hell. I need to make one phone call. If you get arrested, you get to make a phone call. If I'm going to hell, I want at least one phone call. So we go to the nurse's station because that's where the phone is. Nurse says, what's the matter with you? I said, I'm going to hell. <laughs> she said, what do you want to do about it? I said, I want my phone call. <laughs> so she gave me the phone. I called my dad. I said, dad. He said, what? I said, this, this guy, who's, I'm sure he's a nice guy. You know, when you're young, you make decisions. You say things. You know, you probably had the best of intentions, I'm sure. I said, this guy told me I'm going to hell. Dad said, well, do you love Jesus? I said, yes, sir. He said, is he in your heart? I said, yes, sir. He said, well, son, you're not going to hell. I said, I said well, good. Because I was worried for a minute, Dad. <laughs> he, said, he said, let me talk to him. The guy had a little swag, you know, 18-year-old kid. Had a lot of that 18-year-old confidence. <laughs> y'all remember the 18-year-old confidence? Some of y'all are in it. You're like, I know that confidence. I'm in it, right? I feel so confident. You just wait. You just wait. You think you know everything now. You're going to find out you don't, praise God. This 18-year-old kid, he hands you the phone, and he goes like this. He goes, he goes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'll tell him. Yes, sir. Oh, now. Y yes, sir. Brian, you're going to go to heaven. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay. Oh, no, no. Thank you. Yes, sir. And he hands me the phone. I said, hey, Dad. He said, hey, Brian. He said, you're going to stay there one more night, but I'm picking you up tomorrow morning. Is that okay? I said, sorry with me, Dad. As long as I get to go to heaven, praise the Lord. <laughs> but the angle of the context was you got to get saved, and that's true, okay? You have to. Being born again is the entry point. A lot of people get saved and they stay in an environment that all they do is talk about their salvation the rest of their life. And there's nothing wrong with talking about their salvation. We should sing about it and, and, and rehearse it and give our testimony. But if all, you do is, if all you do is talk about that moment, it's like you're driving down the interstate staring in the rearview mirror and you miss everything in the windshield. You're just looking at this kingdom. Like, have you ever heard anybody tell a testimony like this? Man, I used to be the wildest thing you ever saw in your life. I had so much fun every night. We were just, woo, and it was just, yeah, and it was just, yeah, yeah, and it was just, woo. But then Jesus came in my life. What a joy it is to serve him. <laughs> it's like you're magnifying the world you came out of. And the only way you would do that is if you're staring at the rear view because what's in your windshield, listen to this, it's greater than anything you can ask or think. You'll miss it all if you focus on what's behind you. The scripture says, when I was a child, I thought as a child, but when I got older, I set aside childish things. I drank milk. Now I want meat. How many of you would like a little bit of the meat of the word to kind of go to a, a different place in God? You know, he said he'll take us from glory to glory. The scariest thing in your life is not being the same next year. The scariest thing in your life is not changing in the process. See, he wants to take you from this point to this point to this point but we can't be going to the next place if we're staring at the last place. Does this make sense? Yes. So in the process of, of, of time, you, could, you can go to church your whole life and you may hear a thousand messages on being saved and you have to be saved. There's no other way to heaven except through Jesus. The, the, the blood of Jesus Christ is the only entry point, but that is to get you into this new thing. And the new thing is called the kingdom. Everybody say kingdom kingdom is very interesting because when Jesus was walking around with his dozen guys, the disciples, 
They said to him, said, can we ask you a question? And Jesus goes, no. And then he's like, just kidding, of course you can ask. He says, of course you can ask me a question. He said, would you teach us how to pray? How, how are we supposed to pray, Jesus? And Jesus said, pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And he said this, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus talked as much or more about the kingdom than he talked about anything else. The problem is in America, and that's where we are right now, we don't understand kingdom. We understand democracy, which is a very good thing. It has its flaws, but it's a very good thing. The problem with democracy is we don't like them, we vote them out. We like them, we vote them in. Then they change, and we want to vote them out and get somebody else. But that's a choice. A kingdom comes from two words, king's dominion, king's domain. The thing, the area, the entity, the space, the region that the king has total authority. When you said yes to Jesus, you stepped into a completely new kingdom that Jesus didn't get voted into and he cannot get voted out of. He is the alpha and the omega. He is the beginning and the end. It's a kingdom. Everybody say kingdom. So to understand how to get the kingdom operating in this realm, which is what Jesus actually said to pray for, you have to understand what the kingdom looks like up there. Because he didn't say, I want your kingdom to come. He said, I want your kingdom to come on earth like it is in heaven. So we have to know what's it like in heaven. Well, I'm going to give you some keys this morning so that you can apply them to your life and begin to actually walk in the kingdom principles that will bring kingdom results into your life. The problem is they are completely divergent from the things of the world. You can't live the world's life and get kingdom results. You can't live one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom and get kingdom results. If you keep a foot or a toe or an eyelash in the world, you will have the world's results and sporadic kingdom opportunity in your life. But if you'll decide today, I'm going all kingdom all the way because he said the kingdom of God. Jesus, he, he even talked, he didn't just say the gospel all the time. He would say the gospel of the kingdom. The good news of the kingdom. Now, this is important to you and me because Jesus is the king of that kingdom, right? Just nod your head if you believe that. He also said that you will rule and reign with him. Amen. Now, wait, wait, wait. I just want to be like some, I, I'm just fine with the bottom of the barrel. I just want to get in. You can get in that way, but that's not his plan for you. His plan for you is to rule and reign with him in this new kingdom that he offered you access to. The reason that you don't hear it so often is because many people don't understand it and the devil hates when people teach about it because it's when you understand the kingdom that you understand where he fits in the process. He is under your feet. Somebody say amen to that. He's under your feet. And when you begin to understand because of your kingdom authority, he is under your feet. Now, all of a sudden, you begin to recognize whenever he says something to you, you can actually talk back. You can actually tell the devil to get out of your house. You can actually walk in peace that surpasses your understanding because it is the kingdom of Almighty God that is in operation in your life. But the devil, if he can get you to do anything once you get saved, he wants you so focused on the life you used to have that you don't focus on the life that God's trying to give you. He wants you looking back. God says, I want you looking forward. Everybody's eyes are on the front of their face. God did not cause you or, or create you to look backwards the rest of your life. He created you to be looking forward, pressing towards the mark for the prize of the high calling in Christ. So if you're going to understand God, if you're going to understand what's available and what's accessible, you have to understand kingdom. Somebody say kingdom. You have to understand kingdom and kingdom has its own culture. 
its own ideology. It has its own facet. I just want to give you a few today, and I believe this is going to turn into a series because I got about a dozen of them, and we only made it through two in the first service. Praise the Lord. But number one is this. If you're taking notes, write this down. Number one, you have to control your mouth. See, I have my eyes closed. The way I'm not looking at anybody. <laughs> you have to control your mouth. You can't say everything you want to say and live in the kingdom. Oh, you can go to heaven. I'm talking about the kingdom coming here like it is in heaven. I'm talking about experience kingdom benefits. I'm talking about experiencing peace when nobody around you even understands it. I'm talking about experiencing peace when everything around you says you should be wigged out and stressed out the rest of your life. You have to control your mouth because here's the situation. Your thoughts do not have mountain moving power, but your words do. You remember Jesus? He's standing there and, and, and he's talking, to, he's teaching, he's talking. And he goes, I'll tell you what, guys. He goes, look, hand me one of those mustard seeds. And somebody goes, and Jesus goes, got it right here. Praise the Lord. Okay, here we go. If you have faith the size of this mustard seed, which is like a grain of sand, by the way, you can say to the mountain, be removed and be cast to the sea. Don't doubt in your heart and you'll have whatsoever you say. He didn't say you can think the mountain to move. You're not responsible for your thoughts but you are responsible for what you do with them. Oftentimes, you'll have thoughts that are just nuts, okay? Oh, I'm the only one, praise God. I'm, I'm the only one. Somebody cuts you off in traffic. You're like, well, I mean, I could pay the deductible. I'm the only one. A lot of halos in the room today, babe. Praise the Lord. You can have, you can have thoughts that are crazy. But they don't have any power until you say them. So if you're the kind of person that I always say what's on my mind, let me just tell you, you won't live in the kingdom culture here if that's what you're doing. You will live in the world's culture here because that's how the world acts. The world acts like, when I say the world, I'm talking about people that are far from Jesus, that don't know him, that haven't come to terms with their salvation, with who he is. If you're the kind of person just say anything comes to your mind, I'm always going to give them a piece of my mind. I'm always, they're just, everybody's going to know what I'm thinking. Number one, you're miserable to be around, just as a side note. But number two, you're going to have the world's results. But we're looking for kingdom results. Somebody say kingdom. kingdom. When you live in the kingdom, you begin to recognize the power of your words. The Bible says that a horse has just a little bit of metal in its mouth and you control the entire horse. A great big ship has a small rudder and it, you can control the whole ship with just that small rudder. It says your mouth, your tongue is exactly the same way. It controls your entire life and we have people talking like their words don't have gravity. Now, I'm not talking about the world. Let the world say what they want to say. It doesn't mean anything to me. Respectfully, I mean that respectfully. Even though it didn't sound like it. <laughs> But when it comes to believers, we have believers that are just talking, just, just jab, 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 because for lack of knowledge, people perish. If you don't know the power that your word ha words have, you'll just sit there and run off at the mouth, and then you don't realize it. You're calling things that are not as though they were. Nothing good ever happens to me, and then you have four flat tires the next morning. I'm sitting there going, you're a pretty good prophet. What's the lotto numbers? <laughs> because it works both ways. You can call things that are not as though they were. You can call the good things and the manifestations of God into your life. Or you can just put a, you can just put a mandate on all the other issues and struggles in your life. I always get passed over. Nothing good ever happens to me. Hey, you, maybe you said this. If it wasn't for bad luck, I wouldn't have luck. Amen. Well, yeah. You're just writing the pages of your next chapter with your words because God gave you that power. Remember, the, the Bible says, my gifts I give without repentance. Repentance in the Bible doesn't mean I'm sorry. Repentance means to turn from a thing. So when God asks you to repent from sin, he didn't ask you to just apologize. Apologies don't mean that much. But turning away does mean something. 
Now it means I'm changed. I'm different. I've made a decision. So when he said, I give my gifts without repentance, he's saying, I give my gifts and I'm not going to change my mind. I'm going to give you this gift so that one of the gifts that you have is to be able to operate in faith. And faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things we don't see. And it all takes place with the spoken word. So whenever you begin to speak things into the atmosphere, you're creating your future. Whether you're speaking God's word over your life or you're speaking what the world says over your life. So if you're going to live the kingdom life here, you're going to have to control what you say. You're going to have to filter what you say. Don't let everything that comes to your mind come out of your mouth. Your, when it's in your head, it doesn't move mountains. When it comes out of your mouth, it either builds mountains or moves them. So we've got to get to the place, if we're going to experience kingdom culture, that we decide we're going to control what comes out of our mouth. You don't have the right to be rude to your wife. A lot of people are nicer to the waitress at Denny's than they are to their own wife. Pleases and thank yous and all that. And then you get home and it's a bunch of grunts and growls. Like a caveman. <laughs> How was your day? <laughs> <laughs> oh, ladies, y'all aren't immune either. I'll tell you a super simple rule. If you just sounded like your voicemail, you'd be nice. Have you ever called that person and you call their voicemail and they're like, hey, this is Brian. Praise God from on high. Oh, God is so good. Leave me a message after the beep. And you're like, that, that sounds nothing like him. <laughs> you just be the person you want people to believe you are on your voicemail. Man, this is good teaching on a Sunday morning. You got to control your mouth. You can't, you can't live kingdom life acting and talking like the world. You got to call things that are not as though they were. Oh, but my kids are going crazy. I thank God that all my children will serve God to a thousand generations. The doctor said it's bad. There's a bad report. I thank God for the report of the Lord coming in my house very soon. Oh, but it's getting worse. The healing power of God flows in my veins from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. You begin to call things that are not as though they were. Your atmosphere begins to respond to you because when you talk like Jesus, the atmosphere can't tell a difference between you and him. That's why the Bible says when you get baptized, you're clothed in Christ, you're enveloped in Christ. You're walking around with the power that Jesus Christ walked around with. Most people just leave it laying dormant because they don't understand the kingdom. They don't understand what we're walking around with. What are you scared of? Not one thing. Amen. Why is that? I can't picture Jesus being scared. Yeah. Everybody just lift one hand real high. Say this. Say, I refuse, I refuse. to let my mouth yeah. run off by itself. I'm going to call on the word of God in my life, in Jesus' name. Now give God a hand of praise like he's doing something in your life. You go to church your whole life. They'll never teach you about the kingdom. I'm not mad at any other churches. I'm just telling you. You go to church your whole life, never know about the kingdom. You know, well, praise God, I'm saved. I'm saved. I'm saved. I'm saved. I'm saved. I'm saved. 30 years from now, how's things going? Just thankful to be saved. I am too. But what'd you do for the last 30 years? Who's going to heaven because of you? I know you're going to heaven because of Jesus, but who's going to heaven because you told them about Jesus? This is kingdom stuff. Number one, you got to control your mouth. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. Number two, just write this down. Number two, another kingdom trait, very cultural in heaven, love. Love is not optional. And when God actually defined himself, he defined himself as love. Then he said it would never fail. In other words, God never fails. Love never fails. God never fails. God says, I am love. Love never fails. God never fails. Love is not an option in the kingdom. Love is not optional in the body of Christ. You can't jump in and out of love. In and out of love. <laughs> you can't jump in and out of love. You can't do it. You either got to walk in love or don't. Because again, if you go one foot in, one foot out, you're going to have the world results. 
But if you decide to walk in love, let me tell you what love is. Love is not just what you say. Love is what you do. Love is a verb. Love is an action. It's defined in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If you don't know it, you can either read it or go to any wedding <laughs> because they always read it. Love is patient. Love is kind. I always have a little kid reading it a lot of times. Love is patient, kind. It's not envious. It's not boastful. It's not arrogant. It's not haughty. It doesn't look down on others. It endures all things. Loves all things. Hopes all things. Love. So, so let me just kind of word it differently because it's Sunday morning and you're here in the house of God, which makes me think you want to know a little bit more about what the Bible says. If you're not being kind, stop lying to yourself. You're not walking in love. If you're not being patient with your family, stop lying to yourself. You're not walking in love. The minute that you get outside of those characteristics is the moment you get out of love. And the moment you get out of love is the moment the kingdom is no longer fully accessible to you as it is in heaven here. A lot of people are going to get to heaven and they're going to be wigged out for the first 10,000 years because they're going to have to try to figure out how to live kingdom culture. I want to live kingdom culture now as it is in heaven I don't want to be shocked when we get to heaven. There's no backbiting in heaven. There's no gossiping in heaven. In heaven, Nobody is sitting at Hebrew's coffee shop in heaven <laughs> gossiping about somebody. Nobody's sitting in heaven running off at the mouth. You know what? I mean, I like the music, but the angels have to sing that loud. It's not happening. There's no complaining in heaven. So you have a choice. You can either get there and be shocked and have to be almost like taught and converted, or you can live, because this is what Jesus said to pray for, live the kingdom here like it is there. Did you know the Bible says we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses? One translation says it's almost like they're encouraging us or rooting us on. Have you ever felt just that little nudge to do the right thing? Could that be the kingdom of heaven giving you a nudge? Could that be angels' wings tapping you in the right direction? Could that be the voice and the power of God nudging you towards the things of God? I think they can see what's going on, at least in part. Many theologians believe that too. When heaven looks at me, I want them saying, there's somebody that lives like us down there. I believe that's what God's looking for. I believe many people are only experiencing a facet of what God can give them because they don't understand kingdom. They don't understand what he'll really do. They don't understand who they really are. They don't understand what they can really access. They don't understand what's really available. And you have to control how you talk. And then secondly, love is not an option. Love is an option in a democracy because you can vote in or vote out whoever you want. But in a kingdom, the king makes the decision and Jesus said it like this. I'm going to tell you exactly how you can love everybody, and it's super simple. Love your neighbor like yourself. Remember we call it the golden rule? Love your neighbor like you love your, Well, how do I love myself? Well, here's the thing. Most of the time, you judge yourself on your intentions. You hurt somebody's feelings, but you didn't mean to, so you say, I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. I'm sorry about that. And so you're measuring yourself on your intentions. But then somebody says something to you, and we measure them on their actions. So what Jesus is saying, why don't you weigh people on their intentions and overlook their actions? I'll never forget my pastor. Changed my whole life. He taught me how to love. And he said this. Is this okay on a Sunday morning? Are you guys with me? My pastor taught me how to love and, and, and several different times because I served him. And, and we'll, we'll get to some of that in a minute, in either today or the weeks to come. But he taught me so many different things. But several times I would see somebody do something or say something to him or about him. And I thank God that he taught me what he taught me because a lot of it's happened to us now. And you just, there's only one way to prepare for it. You either prepare in the moment or somebody tells you about it. So a lot of times people say something about him. I'm like, Pastor, this won't even take me long. Like, I'll just throw him out of the church. Praise the Lord. And he's like, he's like, Brian, we're not going to do that. I'm like, Pastor, look, here's what they said. He goes, a lot of people say stuff. Maybe they're having a bad day. I'm like, I don't care. And I'm saying that not because I don't like them. It's because I love him. 
and I don't want anybody talking about him. You see what I'm saying? So I, I was like, Pastor, why do you keep overlooking all this stuff? And then somebody did something crazy. And if I told you about it, if I told you about it, you'd, you'd, you'd just be sitting there and be like, oh my gosh, like Samson and Delilah stuff, crazy. And it's brought to my pastor, and he goes, we don't get opportunities like this very often. I'm like, praise God, I get to throw them out, no problem. You just give, you don't even have to say it, preacher. Just give me the head nod. They're out of this church, praise God. That's what I'm thinking. Because that was a lot of the church I grew up in. That's how it was. So he says, we don't have many opportunities like this very often. And I'm like, say no more. That's code for you want Brian to pull their membership. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Maybe take their card and just light it. Be like, oh, here's your future. No, I'm just kidding. That's how I felt, though. I mean, I didn't want them hurting my pastor. If I'm nothing else, I'm loyal. If, if, if we're friends, we're not friends just on the good days. We're not friends just when we agree. If God puts me under somebody, I do not take that lightly. I'm there. So he says, we don't get these kind of opportunities very often. I'm thinking, praise God. Finally, get a rope like Jesus did. Throw the tables over. It's going to be awesome. And he goes, we don't get these kind of opportunities very often to cover this level of sin. I said, <laughs> excuse me? He said, think about this. This is probably the worst thing they've ever done. He goes, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna treat them how we would wanna be treated if the worst thing that we've ever done was made public. And I'm like, Instantaneously, my heart grew and my heart broke. And I knew God was challenging me because this was not religious. This was kingdom stuff. Do you remember Jesus that caught the lady in the act of adultery? I always wonder, why didn't they drag the guy out there too? They drug her out in the street. And everybody's trying to kill her, stone her to death. And Jesus... He says, whoever has never sinned, that's who is authorized to throw the first stone. Everybody left because everybody sinned, except my wife. <laughs> everybody has sinned. What's kind of crazy to think about is Jesus never sinned, so by his own authorization, he could have thrown a rock. But instead of throwing the rock, he said... Where's your accusers? She said, they left. He said this, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Jesus knew it and chose to, and by the way, she didn't say, I'm so sorry. He forgave her before there was any repentance. Isn't that crazy? So when it comes to love, like there's a whole nother level available. My pastor said, we're going to treat them exactly how we would want to be treated if the worst thing we ever did was made public. The worst thing you ever did is not rolling through a stop sign. Don't lie to yourself. There's things each one of us have done. If it came out, we would be very ashamed or embarrassed. So when you learn of somebody going through something or going through a moral challenge, sometimes you find out about it because God's trying to see, can I trust you to cover? The Bible says love covers a multitude of sins. In the body of Christ, we don't need more people eating the wounded. We need people walking backwards in the tent where their flesh is bare and covering it up so nobody else can see it. That's love. That's kingdom love. Everybody say kingdom. That's kingdom love. That's the, that's the, you have to control how you talk, but then you can't bounce in love, bounce out of love. Oh, I love you when you're nice to me. It's not what it says. 
Love is us being kind, not people being kind to us. Matter of fact, the world's never even going to understand you, so get over it. The world is never even going to understand you. You're in a completely different vein, a different kingdom. You stepped out of the world's kingdom and into a new kingdom. Everything is different. So he's calling you and me to love at a level that most people never get close to. Now, this is important to me, and I'll tell you why. We've lived long enough now to have people lie about us. We've lived long enough now to have people stick us in the back. We've lived long enough now to have people make stuff up, attack our family, all these other things. And I'm not saying that complaining at all, not even almost, because I'm going to tell you something, I sleep like a baby. The reason I sleep like a baby is not because people don't talk about me. It's because I don't talk about them. You see what I'm saying? Love is not what they do to you. Love is what you do to them. Well, that doesn't mean you have to go to dinner every week. Don't get that twisted. But on the flip side, it's a completely different scenario. Having watched my pastor and had him teach me, then I knew, oh my goodness gracious, this is how you do it. And for me, and I hope for you, that is the kind of thing I'll give my whole life for. Because I was still trying to balance the political and the, 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 the hip side of Christianity. Where, where it was like, who has the coolest music? They're hot today or... Or, or which preacher has the coolest shoes? They're hot today or, or, or whatever. It was always like a, this. And then all of a sudden, I, I meet somebody that teaches me how to actually love by choosing to cover sin instead of making it known. In the kingdom, love is not an option. It's not, it's not optional if you want kingdom life. Now, l- listen to me. You can go to heaven and you, you don't have to live this, okay? You don't have to go this far. But if you want to see how far you can go in God, like for real, I'm talking about your head hits the pillow and you sleep like a baby with demons surrounding your bed. I'm talking about kingdom stuff. Because when you're in the kingdom, they know they can't mess with you like they can mess with people that that don't understand. It's like a bully. A bully hits people that won't hit them back. Oh, they still might come and do it, but they at least have to count the cost. When the enemy starts messing with a kingdom person, he knows he has to fight. And if there is a fight, he knows he's already lost. Because Jesus said two really strong words on the cross. Three. It is finished. I got got 12 points. I'm not going to go any further. But you got to control how you talk. You got to decide. I'm going to say what God said. I'm not going to talk like the world and expect kingdom results. I'm going to talk like the kingdom then I will expect kingdom results. I'm going to quit prophesying my own faults and failures and start prophesying what God says. Start declaring the will and the word of God over my family. You're authorized to lay hands on your children and watch them recover. From what? Anything from the common cold to the worst cancer imaginable. None of it's hard for God. None of it's hard for God. Well, what do, you, what do you do if you pray and it doesn't work? That's impossible. No, I don't understand. I, I've seen this. Well, let me tell you something. You either get healed immediately, you get healed eventually, or you are healed eternally because heaven is not a penalty. It's impossible. God doesn't fail. I'm just going to give you a few more that we'll, I'm going I'm to share on a little bit more in the next coming weeks. One is joy. Joy is not an option in the kingdom. Joy is your strength. 
So the minute you start operating outside of joy, you have positioned yourself in weakness. The joy of the Lord is your strength. The minute you lose your joy. Well, what if something bad happens? Then you cannot be happy for a moment, but don't lose your joy. Well, how do you do that? The kingdom suffers violence, but the violent take it by force. That word actually says, like, lays hold of, holds on to, refuses to let go. I'm not letting go of my joy for anything. That's why I say, you can say anything about me you want, not anybody here, but people can say anything they want. I'm still going to sleep like a baby because I live in the joy of the Lord. I'm not mad. you mad at me. I'm not mad at you. Matter of fact, I haven't thought about you all week. <laughs> no offense. And you get in that, that frame of mind. You see what I'm saying? And now the joy of the Lord becomes your condition and not a position that you jump in and out of. Because the minute you get out of joy, that's when weakness comes. Oh, but where I'm weak, he's strong. That's a completely different context. That's where you have insecurities. And he comes in with his securities. The Bible says he will be your confidence. But you can't get into a place. You can't get into a place where your joy is contingent upon what happens to you. Because then the devil, all he has to do is bump your wagon a little bit. Now you're out of joy, which means... You're in weakness. Does this make sense? It's a total shift. This is kingdom life. This is real kingdom life. This is next level kingdom life. Have you ever noticed when you say something like this? As long as this doesn't happen, I'll be all right. And the next day it happens. That's because the devil's listening. He doesn't know everything about you. He's listening. And the minute you identify the one thing that'll make you stop serving God, he's going to do that. So instead, why don't you prophesy something different? No devil in hell can stop me from serving God. I'm not going to spend five minutes in worry. I'm going to spend five minutes in worship. I'm not going to be, it does, you know what? Though he slay me, yet will I serve him. If you begin to give your life to God like that, the devil stops messing with you as much. Because he knows rocking your cart is not going to knock you off your rails. Another one we're going to cover is honor. I'm going to say honor. Nobody even understands honor anymore. Honor is not something that you can take. It can only be given. Respect is something you earn, but honor is something that you give. So if you do a good job, you can earn somebody's respect. But they can't make you honor them. You have to choose to honor them. Look at our political environment. Both sides of the fence, there's a bunch of clowns yelling and fussing and cussing at everybody, banging on doors and knocking down signs. There's no honor. Let me tell you something. That's not our kingdom. Our king, let me tell you, that's not happening in heaven. They're not sitting at the coffee shop going, you know what? Next time that ballot comes up, I'm voting Jesus out of there. It's not happening. In heaven, there is honor. The angels don't sit there and go, you know what? I'm getting sick of this song. Let me tell you what would happen. Like lightning from the sky. The devil was an angel that stepped out of honor. Honor's not a joke to God. The Bible says, touch not mine anointed and do him no harm. In other words, honor those that are anointed by God. The problem in the body of Christ is we want to honor those that are anointed unless there's a moral failure and then we want to eat them. I don't care if you have pink hair, blue hair, yellow hair, and and four foot long eyelashes. <laughs> if you lift up the name of Jesus, I consider you on my team and I will honor you. You come in my house and talk about a preacher, I'm going to ask you to leave. No joke. The Bible says that those who minister the gospel, especially those who teach the word, they're due double honor. I believe that's why God called Crystal and me to this region because of how we honored the men and women of God that he placed us under. I believe that's why he did that. I believe that was a facet of why he called us. 
Because he looked and he said, hey, there's somebody that can be trusted right there. Because of the honor that's in the kingdom is not like what's in the world. The world's version of honor is a funeral. When somebody's laying dead, then everybody stands up and honors them. But there's no funerals in heaven. Everybody's walking in honor among the living. Don't let your family member die before you tell them or say about them how you really feel. Honor. Honor in the body of Christ. Where, and don't just think I'm defending charismatics and Pentecostals. I'm talking about anybody who lifts up the name of Jesus. Oh, that's a, that's a dead church over there. They sing out of a hymnal and, uh, don't you ever get caught saying that. Not by me. I'm talking about don't, don't catch yourself saying that. Those churches that you talk about, most of the time, it took years to build them. Most of the churches that were planted in the United States of America while the frontier was being settled were planted by denominations. You won't find me talking about denominations. We don't have to agree on everything, but I'll honor you. You lift up the name of Jesus. Well, I just, those old songs, they're just, they're just, oh, what? have you ever read a hymnal? The artistic effort that was put in to write those songs to magnify God. The symphonic scores that were written to come up underneath those lyrics. And because it's not our flavor, we want to wag our finger at it. That's not kingdom. And that's why the hand of God doesn't move like he's capable of moving. Because the culture doesn't fit. Because if we want his kingdom to come here, we got to act like his kingdom acts there. There's no dishonor in heaven. $200,000, a $300,000 pipe organ that took an engineer and an architect three years to design how it would be built into the building surrounded by the stained glass. When we drive by and we turn our nose up because they don't worship how we worship, they read from the same book. They magnify the name of Jesus, but we dishonor and the moment you step into dishonor, the kingdom, the kingdom is shut in your life. Because in heaven, there is honor. Last point, I'm going to pick this up next week. The centurion who came to Jesus, he had a servant that was sick. He said, he said, he said you don't have to come to my house. He said, he said, if you'll just say the word. If you'll just say the word, my servant will be healed. And he said to him, he said, he said, I tell this servant, he said, I understand honor. He said, I tell this one to do something, he'll do it. I tell this one to do something, he'll do it. He said, I understand honor. And Jesus said, I haven't seen faith like this in all of Israel. Honor. Don't be kind to everybody outside your house and then make everybody tolerate you because they love you in your house honor. Somebody say honor. These are kingdom principles. They'll change your very life. They'll take you from where you are to where God's actually called you to be. You'll see his hand move in your life in a way that you've never expected and you've never thought of because when you begin to act like heaven acts here, you'll see heaven get involved in your situation. When you begin to see heaven move, then all of a sudden you become enticing to those around you. All of a sudden, you begin to flow in a different way. You begin to watch how you talk. You begin to love one another. You begin to say, you know what? I don't have to understand everything, but I'm not losing my joy. It doesn't matter. I'm just not losing my joy. All of a sudden, the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray starts coming true in your life. The kingdom of heaven there starts manifesting here. You start living in peace when nobody around you can understand it. You start walking in joy unspeakable that nobody can even comprehend. 
And let me just say this as I close, I guess for the 30th time now, I think. It's really available. Let's all stand to our feet. But I want you to know, like, it's really available. This is not, this is not a fairy tale. It's not a figment. This is not, this is not hocus pocus or some silliness. This is as real as rain. The kingdom of God is accessible now. Jesus said the kingdom of God is at hand. It's at hand. The kingdom of God is accessible right now. You don't have to live like the world. Give your life to Jesus today. And if you've been saved, give it to him again. But give it all to him. and say, I don't want to live in the world and be saved. I want to be a kingdom person. I want to walk through this thing. I want to see God move. I want to see my house flourish. I want to see my business do well. I want to see health flood my family. I want to see God. I want to see people born again. I want to see kingdom life. I don't want just a normal Christian religious experience. I want Jesus. And I want his kingdom. Just bow your head and close your eyes. If you're here today, you've never given your life to Jesus. He can't fail you. Maybe you've tried other things, other ideas, other thoughts, but you've never given it to him. If that's you, in just a minute, I want to give you an opportunity to give your life to Jesus. Or maybe you'd say it differently. You'd say, well, you know, I used to walk strong with God. Something happened. I backslid. Now I'm far from him. I, I want back in the kingdom. I want to know that I know that I know where I stand with him. Every head bowed and every eye closed. If that's you and you're here today, you've never given your life to Jesus or you used to walk strong with him and something happened and you backslid and you need to give your life back to him. When I count to three, I want you to lift your hand. And with an uplifted hand, you're simply saying, God, remember me. And he really, really will. He really, really will. If that's you and I count to three, lift your hand high. Nobody's looking around. One, two, three, lift your hand. Lift it high. I see that hand. 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 Praise the Lord. I see that hand. Praise the Lord. I see that hand. Praise the Lord. I see that hand. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Lift it tall. If you lifted your hand or you wanted to, I want you to pray this prayer from the bottom of your heart after me. Matter of fact, church, help us pray. Say this. Say, oh God, I come to you now and I ask you to save me. Write my name in your book. I turn from sin and I turn to you. I'm a Christian now and I'm going to live the kingdom life here like it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. We so salute you in that powerful decision. Make sure and stop by the light wall after service. We want to get you involved in a life group and our first touch team as quickly as possible so that iron can sharpen iron in your life. I want to ask one more question before we leave. If you're here today and you've never joined our church, you've never joined New Heights, but you say, you know what, this is the place for me. This is where I want to be. The Bible says this. Those that are planted in the house of the Lord will flourish in God's courts. We want you to flourish, not just here, but in God's courts. That's outside of here. The Bible also says that whenever you get connected to a ministry like this, that every grace that's on this house comes on your house. Have you experienced that? Has any New Heights members experienced just grace on your life? If that's you and you're here today, you say, I've never joined the church, but I know maybe it's your first time here, you've been coming for weeks, but you know this is a house for you. Maybe you're going to be here for a while, or maybe you're just here for school, but you know this is the house for you. When I count to three, lift your hand real tall. I'm not going to call you to the front. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to put a microphone in your face, but we do want to tell you we love you as you make that bold declaration of faith. If you want to make New Heights Church your home, when I count to three, lift your hand. One, two, three, lift your hand, tall and bold. Praise God. God bless you. Congratulations. Is there anyone else? There you go. Praise God. If you want to make that decision today, we're so proud of you. Listen, also stop by the light wall. That way you can get some information about being a member. But I want you to know 
that we are behind you 100%. It's our dream that your dreams would come to pass. Can you say amen to that? Lift your hands. Father, bless your people coming in. Bless them going out. Bless them in the city and the field, this day and every day, as we live the kingdom life for you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you. We'll see you Wednesday night. Hey guys, we just want to thank you for joining us online. We hope you enjoyed today's broadcast. Here at New Heights, we are passionate about two things, loving people and pointing them to Christ. So help us by liking, sharing, and commenting on everything you see come across our social media. It means the world to us. If you like what you've experienced today, you can also revisit this message you just watched or any other sermon at newheightschurch.info. We hope you have a great week. We'll see you next time.